Hi, everybody. Good to be able to worship with you this day. It certainly is. All. There we are. Hi, everybody. So just to warn you that the uh, worship service is going to run extra long today, which is why we have the food up front. Nah, just kidding. Just kidding. It's a super Sunday at FCOB. This is a great Sunday. Uh, number one, uh, it is Super Bowl Sunday. This is conclusion of our Super Bowl drive. We've been collecting uh, non-perishable food items that will be donated to the Frederick Rescue Mission. Thank you so much for your contributions. We greatly appreciate the food items that you've donated. This isn't all of them. There's still some more in our um, shopping carts in the other parts of the church. But thank you for those donations. And they will be given to the Frederick Rescue Mission. Um, those will be distributed this week. I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Greg. I serve as pastor of discipleship and evangelism. Uh, also today, a super day is that uh, we will be installing, for those of you here for the first time, we're actually installing a new lead pastor today. Pastor Peter uh, will be the lead pastor here at our church. This is a, a, a great opportunity. Go ahead, give him an applause. <laughs> so greatly, greatly thankful of, of your leadership style and your heart for God. Definitely appreciate that, Pastor Peter. But that installation service will be taking place in just a moment. Then following our, this service, just a reminder, we do have a, a fellowship meal planned for following this service downstairs. In your worship bulletin, hopefully you got one of these. If you didn't pick one of these up, I, I hope there's some more back there. There's a lot of information in this bulletin about upcoming events. I want to promote just a few this morning. Number one is that on March the 23rd, we are hosting, again, again hosting, a trunk or, tr or excuse me. <laughs> what time of the year is it? <laughs> Easter egg hunt. There we go. Doing again over at Carver Park by Lincoln Elementary School. And you'll see information on in your bulletin about ways that you might volunteer. Yes, you could donate candy, absolutely. Uh, just, but you can also volunteer and serve that day. And it's an incredible ministry. I don't know if you've ever participated in the, uh, the egg hunt at Carver Park, but just the, the lives that you're able to, to, to connect with and, the, and the, the children that you're able to bless that day. It's incredible. So look over your bulletin. There's a list of announcements there. A lot of other save the date items in your bulletin. I want you to look over that. Uh, I'm not going to highlight all of them. But there is one that I did want to point out, Living Water Ministry, you probably have heard us talking about this now for a short while. Um, the church has decided to provide funding for a shower ministry in the city of Frederick. Uh, and um, the shower, the actual shower trailer is just about completed. And uh, there's going to be a ribbon cutting ceremony on March the 8th at the rescue mission, that's Friday, at the rescue mission at 2.30, uh, which will kick off that, that uh, shower ministry making its way through Frederick. We don't anticipate it being here on our campus until late April, early May. But if you're interested in finding out more information about how you could volunteer with this shower ministry, uh, please either contact me, stop out at guest services, um, give them your name and, re and, and they'll get in contact with me and I can give you all information on ways that you can volunteer in this ministry. It's a great, great ministry that will be taking place in the city of Frederick. Ribbon cutting ceremony, March the 8th at the Rescue Mission. Again, look over your bulletin. A lot of other events listed in there, uh, something, something that you might find interesting. Today, of course, is our installation sunny Sunday. Sunday. I'll get, I'll get the words out. Don't worry. Today is our installation Sunday for Pastor Peter, and our district executive, Eddie Edmonds, is here, and he's uh, going to continue on with that installation service. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, and I bring greetings on behalf of the Mid-Atlantic District of the Church of the Brethren. I have a long and <clears throat> very... Uh, happy relationship with the Frederick 
Church of the Brethren. I served here as 11 year, for 11 years as moderator of this congregation. Now, for most of you young folks, that was so long ago you would have to read it in a history book. Uh, but for some of us that have gray hair or no hair, uh, we can remember that. The Church of the Brethren throughout its history has embraced the concept of the Believer's Church and the priesthood of all believers. Thus, when persons are baptized, they are ordained into ministry in the church. To assist the members in this shared ministry, the Church of the Brethren calls men and women to special tasks and ordains them for set-apart roles of leadership. Such persons are recognized as having the gifts and training that qualify them for special leadership responsibilities. These gifts may include preaching, teaching, counseling, evangelism, administration, and other specialized services in the life of the church. Today we celebrate an important moment in the life of your congregation as we install a person to lead you in your ministry. You have called Peter Myers to be a servant in the name of Christ in this place. Peter, I invite you to come. Peter, you've been called to be the lead pastor of this congregation. You have accepted the call. Do you believe that this call and your acceptance of it are in response to the leading of the Holy Spirit? If so, say, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Will you be in constant prayer, a faithful interpreter of Scripture, a pursuer of the truth, and a proclaimer of the Word of God as it is understood in this church? If so, say, yes, I will. Yes, I will. Will you attempt to live honestly, openly, and justly with your brothers and sisters in this congregation? Will you seek to be sensitive to the needs of each person? Will you work diligently to fulfill your assigned responsibilities? And will you represent this congregation to the wider community in a way that will embody the teachings of the New Testament. If so, say, yes, I will. Yes, I will. Peter Myers, I charge you in the presence of God and these people to be faithful to the vows you have just taken. Let the words addressed to Timothy be spoken to you also. Proclaim the message. Be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and carry out your ministry fully. May God give you the Holy Spirit for the work of ministry now committed to you in this congregation. Remember that God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Congregation, you are not void of responsibility. You have called Peter Myers to be your lead pastor. He has responded to your call and has promised to perform faithfully the responsibilities of this ministry. It is your responsibility, and I underscore that, it is your responsibility to give Peter your loyal support undergird him and his work with your prayers. Grant your pastor the freedom to be the person God created him to be. Encourage your pastor in the expression and use of the gifts that he uniquely possesses. Be with him a mutual seeker of the truth, a learner of the way, and a co-worker in the kingdom. Appreciate the heritage of the church in recognizing the freedom of the pulpit. Be a good employer to your pastor, exercising fairness and honesty in all agreements. 
do you now pledge your support and your full cooperation to the pastor you have called? If so, rise in affirmation. Peter, in the name of Jesus Christ, and as a representative and under the authority of the Mid-Atlantic District of the Church of the Brethren, I now affirm that you are officially installed as the lead pastor of this congregation. Though I do not have a crown nor a scepter, <laughs> I extend to you the right hand of fellowship and pray that God will bless you every step of the way. I invite you to join me in prayer. Creator God, the one who gave life to each person in this sanctuary, be with us now, equipping us, undergirding us, encouraging us, and sending us in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Be with Peter and his bride as they continue to live their life support him and his family but god most of all bring together the lead pastor the other pastors and staff and this congregation in a way that is a beacon to this community that here in this place we worship you through a faith in your son jesus christ the truth of the word printed in your bible and given to us by the Holy Spirit who encourages and equips us along the way. Be it so, O oh God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Please remain standing, and we're going to worship our Jesus Messiah.
Thank you, friends. You may have a seat. Um, we do have a, a children's church at this time. If, uh, if you'd like to have your children make their way down to children's church, now would be a good time. Um, we're also going to uh, just to share a moment of prayer. Will you permit me to just share one little thing before we enter into this time of prayer? I know about a year ago, we, uh, we were a bit uh, unnerved when Pastor Kevin announced that uh, he was resigning his uh, tenure here and headed to Florida. And we began to wonder what, what's going to become of us? Where, where will we go? And I had this overwhelming sense at that time that this was just a transition time. That it's not like, <laughs> you know, it's not like the Lord removed his Holy Spirit from this place. Amen? Amen? It's not like the Lord said, I'm done working in you and through you. That, that's not what he was saying. But he was saying to us that it, at such a time as this, a new leader is needed. And uh, the God has given us Pastor Peter whose leadership, I am, I am just so, so impressed with his leadership style. So for the time now and the time ahead, the Lord has given us Pastor Peter, and I am thankful for that. And I, I look forward to the great and glorious things that the Lord will do in us, right, through his teaching, but also the great and mighty works that the Lord will do through us as a church. Amen? that God will continue to be praised, that Jesus Christ will continue to be lifted up, and we will take that, we will love and we will proclaim, and we will reach with Christ and his gospel until he calls us home. I'm so very thankful to have you here, Peter. Let's enter in a time of prayer, and then uh, I'll, let, uh, I'll let Peter share. Father God, thank you again for this day. Father, thank you for continuing to work in our lives. You have been answering prayers left and right in our lives. But this morning, Lord, I think it's important for us to remember this one, one important truth. And, and, and Pastor Peter is going to share this momentarily in his message. We don't praise you. We don't come to you on our knees and saying, I surrender you all. I surrender all of myself to you, Lord. We don't do that because things go our way, but, but because of who you are. And I think this past year is, is evidence of that. Although we were a bit unnerved, we began to wonder and question what's next for us. Lord, you remained faithful. Father, as we enter a new season as a church together, I anticipate and I look forward to the great things that would be done in your name through the faithful church, the faithful children of God in this place. Father, I look forward to those whom you might bring to this place. I look forward to those who might meet Christ for the very first time through our work and through our testimony and through our witness. Father, we are at your mercy. We are your laborers. And here we look at the vineyard and, and, and the harvest is so ripe in this community. Help us to become eager workers, eager laborers, Lord, in your name. Father, I, I pray a very special blessing and anointing on Pastor Peter as he continues to lead both today and tomorrow. I pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs> now I get to preach. Some of you will be glad to know that this is the final message from Habakkuk. Um, we're in chapter 3. 
We started that chapter last week, and we're going to wrap it up today. So I'm going to read. I'm going to read from verse three all the way to the end through 19. So if you have your Bibles, open them, please. Habakkuk three, beginning at verse three. God came from Timon, the Holy One, from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hands where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Kushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Were you angry with the rivers, O Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses and your victorious chariots? You uncovered your bow. You called for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains, the mountains saw you and writhed. Torrents of water swept by. The deep roared and lifted its waves on high. Sun and moon stood still in the heavens at the glint of your flying arrows, at the lightning of your flashing spear. In wrath, you strode through the earth, and in anger, you threshed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With your own spear, you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pens and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of the deer. He enables me to go on the heights. Amen. Are the lights up as high as they can go? Thank you. Hi. (laughs) Wow. Okay. Just a brief prayer, and then we'll go on. Father, what we are not, teach us. What we have not, give us. What we know not, teach us, make us, give us all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, I'd like for you to imagine, if you would, that you are witnessing an intense argument between two friends, two close friends. They talk back and forth, and the one friend becomes quite heated in his remarks. He begins to attack the other person's character. But you notice that that it's during this encounter that that the other friend remains pretty calm, even in the midst of this barrage. He listens, he challenges his friend's assumptions, clarifies, is that actually what I said? Are you sure that's what I mean? Are you understanding what I meant there? But he doesn't argue. So they they continue the argument for a while, and then all of a sudden, the one who had been worked up suddenly has a change of heart, a change in tune, and he begins to talk about how faithful his friend is, how faithful his friend has been. And he says, I don't always understand our relationship, but I appreciate your patience. I appreciate your care for me. I appreciate the way that you put up with me. And as you watched... 
you'd likely think it quite odd that someone who was so angry and so frustrated with someone would then suddenly begin to praise that same person. That's, in a sense, what happened in the book of Habakkuk, and especially as we see in chapter 3. You'll recall that chapters 1 and 2 were largely about Habakkuk's two complaints against God and God's reply to Habakkuk. But then we, we began last week to look at chapter 3, and we found that the complaining was over. The prophet chose to end, not with a new complaint, not with a proposed solution to the problem of evil, and not by summarizing some particular doctrine. He ended with a song. What I just read to you was a song, and it's a song about faith. Now, the structure of this chapter clearly is different from the rest of the book. I hope you were able to work your way through that with me. It's different kind of writing. But the fact that he ended in this way is fitting because throughout this book, we saw a prophet question faith. We saw a prophet even counter the assumptions of what faith is in that so many believers might not want to raise questions for fear of appearing unfaithful. I wouldn't dare ask such a question. But Habakkuk showed us the faith that has been challenged and then has come out on the other end stronger is the kind of faith that sustains. Now, to be clear here, what we have seen is not that all of Habakkuk's questions and doubts were answered by God. In fact, you know they weren't. And God certainly hasn't changed his mind regarding how he was going to deal with a rebellious and sinful people. And in particular, the evil of Babylon. God's plan remained intact. God's plan would proceed. But look at verse 16, if you would. Habakkuk said, I heard, in the midst of all of this, what he was describing there in this song, he then says, I heard, and my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones, and my legs trembled. Yet I'll wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Habakkuk no longer had any theological or philosophical questions for God. Habakkuk saw everything perfectly clearly at this point. But as a man, he was afraid. One commentator reminds us that some of God's greatest people of faith were quite anxious when they confronted danger, men like Abraham, David, Jeremiah, John the Baptist. The Apostle Paul, you'll recall, as he preached his sermon in Corinth in weakness and fear and much trembling. Those weren't just words he used. To know the truth and to understand the doctrines is most important. But despite that understanding, you can still be scared. And of course, the evil one is going to try to persuade you that somehow lacking is your faith if you're showing fear at all. That's just not true. Remember that courage is the willingness to confront something scary despite your fear. So I'd argue that Habakkuk here was, was courageous, which might account for the fact that he was singing at this point. Imagine that, singing. And he was singing about faith. And in so doing, he answered for God's people today a very important question. And that question is, during our worst times, what does genuine faith look like? During our worst times, what does genuine faith look like? And before we get too far along in this, I want to go back to chapter 2 and verse 4 for just a moment. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith. Now, you might have heard that last part of that verse before you may have 
wondered, well, then maybe I've read Habakkuk before. Well, probably not, but you saw it in the New Testament. You saw it in Romans 1, you saw it in Galatians 3, and in Hebrews 10. Literally, that verse reads, the one who by faith is righteous shall live. But for a moment, I want us to pay attention to that entire verse. If I were to ask you, what is the opposite of faith, most people would answer, well, the opposite of faith is doubt, obviously. But remember, Habakkuk has taught us throughout this that both faith and doubt can coexist. You can be faithful and have doubt. Habakkuk had trusted God fully, and yet he looked around and he saw Judah literally coming apart at the seams. And what was his response? Well, he didn't run away from God. He ran to God, actually. He turned to God, which showed that he, in fact, trusted God. You don't turn to somebody you don't trust, clearly. He knew that God would listen. That is faith. So what then is the opposite of faith? Well, according to Habakkuk here, it's pride. The opposite of faith is pride. Verse 4, another translation says, look at the proud. But the righteous, they're the faithful ones. The opposite of faith is pride. Certainly Babylon, we know that. Babylon was filled with self-importance, self-worship even. They were cruel people, brutal people. They saw themselves as judge and jury. They decided what was right and wrong in their own eyes. And if anyone attempted to stand in their way, well, they were just literally beaten into submission. Babylon was the epitome of pride. But don't forget, Judah had the same problem. There were different symptoms, but it was the same illness. According to Habakkuk, Judah no longer trusted God. Judah would no longer even listen to God which meant that their own opinions, their own judgment became more important to them. They became a nation of oppression and violence as well to their own people. And Habakkuk, with his own doubts and his complaints, he, he could have assumed that God had no answers. So his way of seeing things, his understanding of the world, well, that would be the correct one. God says he loves his people, and yet he's allowing all of this. We've heard that. We may have even thought that. Could he really be in control? It's assumptions leading to arrogance. Well, think about it. It's such a limited understanding we have about God and his ways, and yet we still want to challenge God as if we've got any standing before him. We grumble about him. It's not fair. We don't deserve this. Well, that's not doubt. That's surely not faith either. That is arrogance. Habakkuk was different. Habakkuk was different. He, he humbly trusted that God was good even when he couldn't understand what God was doing. His faith made all the difference for how he approached life in this world. And he ended his prophecy again with a song. And this song expressed his deep trust in who God is and what he's able to do. But you see two things that Habakkuk had that we need today, sorely we need today. First, as I just mentioned, Habakkuk showed such a courageous faith, didn't he? Courageous to stand in the way that he did. Habakkuk had what's called grit. It's not a word we use a lot today. I remember my dad used to use that word grit. He described people that he admired as having grit. That guy has grit. Person with firm character. Person with a determined personality. People with grit can't be defeated. You can't keep them down. They have an indomitable spirit. They, they face challenges, but they just keep going. They just keep getting up again and again. They hit a rough patch. There's a job loss. There's, there's a health crisis. There's a, a, a loss of death in the family. But ultimately, it doesn't matter. If they played a sport, 
They were such that regardless of the actual score, it would always be zero to zero in their mind. Always. It's a new game. Now think about Habakkuk there in verse 15 again. Let's see that again. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the great waters. I heard, and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones, and my legs trembled. Now, you read that, and you may wonder. I don't see a whole lot of grit there. It doesn't look very courageous there. But again, courageous people can fear. Habakkuk believed what the Lord said. Judgment is coming. Judah is going to fall. And this scared him badly. It scared him. Of course it would. Physically, he was falling apart. Surely you've experienced something that was so dreadful that you physically felt it. You felt ill, weak. Because he knew that his people were going to experience the worst kind of pain and suffering. His family and friends were going to lose everything, if not their lives. If you've ever had to deliver terrible news to someone, well, you know how hard that is. As a chaplain with the police department here, one of my responsibilities is being with people who are in the midst of trauma. Notifying family members of a loved one's death. That's hard. And I don't even know these people. And it's hard. Habakkuk had to tell the people he loved. He loved these people. It was, it was emotional. It was mental. It was physical. It was, it was exhausting. It was tough. Trembling and quivering would be an honest an understandable response to his predicament here. And yet, Habakkuk was honest. He didn't try to soften his message. He didn't ham and haw, beat around the bush. He just simply faced it. God doesn't try to portray, uh, grit, I'm sorry, grit doesn't try to portray a certain persona. There's no false bravado. You may know people who, who express their spirituality this way. They, they, they talk a good game. They, they use the right words. They quote the right passages. They seem mighty pious. But then when it's their turn, behind closed doors, they just can't handle the adversity. Which is fine not to be able to handle the adversity. But just, we don't need the show ahead of time. And yet, Habakkuk there said in verse 16, he said, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. He believed what God had said. One commentator wrote, and I found this to be helpful for perspective, the military superpower that was going to completely destroy and remove his nation would get its just reward. This would have been unthinkable for the average person in that day. It would be like telling someone that within two years, the United States, China, and Russia will no longer exist or influence global politics. Such was the state of power for Babylon in that day. You, you think about where your mind goes, where your emotions go, when, when people wrong you in minor ways. Just think for a moment. And here come all of the messages in your mind. Well, this, this, is, this isn't right. This guy's getting away with being a jerk. And yet here was Habakkuk. It, it's about proportion. Here was, here was Habakkuk facing economic devastation. He was facing social devastation, famine. Everything was bleak. Everything appeared lost and hopeless, and yet he trusted, he believed that God would work it all out in his time. What was that going to look like? Wasn't quite sure. Look at verse 18 again. Yet I will complain in the Lord. No, I will rejoice in the Lord. 
I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go in the, on the heights. That's grit, okay? That's grit. Lord, I know what's coming. It's going to be painful. There's going to be suffering and there's going to be confusion. But still, I will find joy and delight and my comfort in you. That's gritty faith. Incidentally, this is a lesson. This is a lesson that the American church needs today deeply, desperately, immediately. Because generally speaking, and I am speaking very generally, we lack the grit, the perseverance that we need to face in those times and in the times in which we live. Too often when life becomes difficult, we have this bad habit of quitting. I'll just go find something easier, which of course we never do. My friend died, that's not fair. So we become angry with the Lord, we leave his church. I'll show him. My life has been a series of challenges followed by failure. I'm exhausted. And where is God anyway? Why is it that I'm the one who always has the problems? Now, people want to avoid pain, disappointment, failure. We hate all that, of course. And so what do they do? They end up chasing the latest self-help ideas. Or read this book. Why don't you try this prayer? I've got a great program for you. 30 days to a new you. The problem, though is that life becomes truly difficult and the prayer mantras or the steps to a better life, they don't work. Your health still declines. The people in your lives that you love still die. The relationships upon which you depend still disappoint. Your spiritual band-aids, the bumper sticker phrases, the, the social media postings, they don't work. They can't heal your deep wounds and they certainly cannot heal this broken world. You know, your friends who are not believers, if you really pay attention to the things they're saying, if you listen to the stories about what's happening out there in this world, and you cut through all of the noise of the politics and all of the tribalism that's, that's occurring, you see that people are starving for answers. People want truth. They want to know who's going to be there to suffer with me. Who's going to help me through these dark times? I appreciate so much the fact that Habakkuk does not answer with easy solutions here. He doesn't give us simplistic phrases. God is good. I know that. But life still stinks right now, okay? We need gritty faith. We need a faith with courage. We need a faith with honesty that says when life is hard, it's okay. Actually, it is necessary that we admit it. We admit it. And that when we don't understand what's happening or why it's happening, we can ask. But also we need a faith that proclaims loudly that while we wait for those answers, we can trust in God's promises. You see, it's not ultimately what my brother or sister says. As much as that's helpful, please don't stop encouraging each other. But it's what God has done that matters most. And that, secondly, is what Habakkuk shows us here, what I'd call a remembering faith, a faith that finds encouragement in history in what has occurred in the past. If you look in the Psalms, you notice that whenever the writer faced difficult situations, what did he do? He looked backwards. He looked back in history, how God dealt with his people in the past. And the result was praise. Well, again, in chapters 1 and 2, Habakkuk described pain and frustration and anger, and yet now in this chapter, his song was one of what? It was celebration. Because everything had gotten better? No. He was rejoicing in God's strength and God's power 
But understand that here, remember, Habakkuk hadn't yet seen what God was describing. He was prophesying. So he could look back in history and he could remember God's work. Verses 3 to 7, I'll read. There's no slide for this. Just listen. God came from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and His praise filled the earth. His splendor was, was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from His hands where His power was hidden. Plague went before Him. Pestilence followed His steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age-old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Kushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. Now, I read that. Why? Taman, Mount Paran, Kushan, Midian. Those are historical places where God had led his people and had saved them. I mentioned the psalmist. Look with me at Psalm 77. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and my soul refused to be comforted. Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has, he, has his promise failed for all time? I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. Folks, the lessons here are obvious. We need to learn to remember the faithfulness of our God. Because it may be that the truth of his faithfulness is the only thing that is going to uphold us in the days ahead. We're going to have those times. You're going to have those times. The state of our world is not going to improve. Sorry to disappoint if you had other visions of the world. It's been the hope of generations that with more education or, or more upward mobility or, or more compassion, if we could just end all wars, if we, could, if we just had more understanding, well, the world would be a better place except that that dream has never materialized. It never will materialize because we, its inhabitants, are born into sin. And sin has only one consequence, deterioration, death. And sin has only one solution, in the name of Jesus. If we're to move ahead, it's going to happen as we look back and remember God's faithfulness. It'll happen as we remember how the Lord has fought for his people and won time and time again. You see, Habakkuk's faith was not blind. He wasn't naive. Fingers crossed, positive thinking, hope this all works out. No, he trusted God because God had proven time and time and time again that he could be trusted. The Christian faith is based upon facts, not simply ideas or tenets. This is not Buddhism. We're not saved by ideas. We're, we're saved by facts, events that actually happen. Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sin, and he rose to defeat death. That actually happened. And by the way, that's what distinguishes the Christian faith from all of the religions. Our doctrines are based on facts, not just ideas or tenets or ideas or, or, or theories. Otherwise, we have no hope. We have no comfort. James Bruckner, who's a theologian, he said, he said it this way. He said, remembering the past gives an anchor for the present while faithful people wait for the future. That's good. I like that. Remembering the past gives an anchor for the present while faithful people wait for the future.
In the moment, Habakkuk could not understand the work of God that would ensue. He, he, he it just he couldn't get it. But he could look back. And he could remember God's work for his people. And so he held on. He doubted, he complained, he feared, but he held on. And we can too. We can cry out like Habakkuk in chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. He is my strength. Because we know the world's going to fall apart. Your lives, my life, may indeed fall apart. But he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen? You know, that's an important reason why we gather for worship regularly, in person, loved ones at home. Some of you can't be here. That's great. I'm glad we have this for you. But if you can be here, you need to be here. We need encouragement. We need reminders of these truths. You know, it's so sad when I see people come through the doors out of a sense of duty. I, don't under, I do understand on one level what that's about. But where's your anticipation? Where is your sense of expectation and joy? Because gathering here in this place with each of you is, among other things, about remembering our great God, who He is, what He has done. When we gather, we declare our faith. We repent of our sin. And we're reminded of His grace. We look around the room and we're reminded of His grace. And by virtue of being together, we remember we're not alone. We're all a mess coming here to be a mess together. Because he's good. God has done a work in your brothers' and sisters' lives. He's comforted them. He's encouraged them. He's given them wisdom and he's given them strength in the midst of their struggles. And their stories inspire us. Your stories inspire me. And then, of course, most importantly, we remember Jesus. We remember why Jesus came and he lived and he died and he rose and he ascended. We remember how he conquered evil for your holiness. That happened. God acted in history. You might not see God every day. We might say, I don't feel God every day. He doesn't post his work on social media. And sometimes, yes, when life is hard, it can feel like the Lord is far away. You look around and you see injustice and you watch at the way morality is redefined. And you wonder, God, what are you doing? But, but then you remember his faithfulness in your life. In your life. You remember his faithfulness in your brothers' and sisters' lives. Because there's that brother or sister who is an absolute mess at what they're going through. And yet, we see God at work. You remember his promises and you think about his work for you on the cross and you can rejoice and you can worship him still. You, you could say that we gather here weekly for renewal. Renewal. Meaning that something's worn out or broken. Something needs repair. Any of you feeling worn out or broken this morning? Need some repair, Greg? He had a week off. He's good. Okay. <laughs> you feeling worn out? Of course you are. 
And so we gather and we sing and we pray and we study His Word and we bask in God's amazing grace and His mercy upon us. And we sit there and we wonder, Lord, how could you choose the likes of me? And we find encouragement and we find strength for a new day. So while we wait, let's gather. Let's declare as the prophet declared. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. I will worship you still. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your help and guidance through these chapters and verses these past weeks. Thank you for the lessons learned. Father, I pray so much that People will see you in the midst of all of that chaos that was that book. We do thank you, Lord, for your work, the ways in which we can look back and, and, and rejoice in the fact that you are God. And we can see it. We, we can see it because we've experienced it. Our brothers and sisters have experienced it. We can look to Scripture and read and know truth and we're so grateful God I pray your blessing on this congregation this day as we continue to celebrate you and it's in your name that we pray amen just stand and worship with us as we sing great are you Lord
Friend, I pray that this series through Habakkuk, I got it right finally, but this series through Habakkuk has truly been a blessing to you. Uh, next week, please, please join us again. We're going to begin a study in uh, Sermon on the Mount, which uh, should be very, very interesting. If you've, uh, if you've seen the episode of The Chosen, where they show the Sermon on the Mount, this is going to be a lot more. So you want to make sure you join us next week for that series, which begins. Uh, but today, just leave with this quick reminder that because of the death of Christ on the cross, we have been delivered from sin's penalty. Because of the giving of the Holy Spirit, we have been delivered from sin's power. But we have yet to be delivered from sin's presence. And in the midst of a sinful world that has gone awry, the only thing that we can lean on are the promises of God found in Jesus Christ. If you want to know more about what that means, what does it mean the promises of Jesus Christ. Come talk to me afterwards. If you're online, go to the uh, go to the home page of the website and fill out one of those connect cards, and I can get in touch with you. One of us will. But if you need to know more what that means to be delivered from the presence of evil through faith in Jesus Christ, talk to me afterwards. Talk to Pastor Peter. Talk to any one of our deacons here. We'd be glad to have that conversation with you. For now, may you go in peace. And for those who are planning, we'll make our way downstairs then to the uh, lower level right below here for our fellowship time. Go in peace, my friend, and worship the Lord.